Hello everyone, welcome back to my study and to Dongit's model railway. No significant progress has been made on the layout since the summer. The period between Christmas and New Year offered a great opportunity to resolve this. The track has ended here and here for quite a long time. I recently wired this double junction. I want to see the track across the big bridge and over here on the north side of the layout. I need to lift the upper bridge surface out to get access to lay track underneath, but I also need to know where it will be to lay the track appropriately through here, so I'm drawing this out on the underlay below. I'm also doing the same for where I think the tunnel mouths are going to end up, so I know where these tracks would disappear from view. The next thing I need to know is where I'm planning to put the signals. On the left hand track, placing the signal between the bridge and the tunnel mouth is likely to have sighting problems. If I bring it in front of the bridge, it will be much easier for drivers to see. This is roughly the path of the track here, and you can see how obstructed the signal would be if I fitted it in the tight gap between the bridge and the tunnel mouth, versus how much better it will be sighted in front of the bridge. On the other track there is a lot more space and it makes more sense to put the signal on the far side of the bridge where there is more clearance between the tracks. This will be the first new section of track to be laid, up to a point about 15 centimetres inside the tunnel mouth, where I will change the track standard from the code 100 of the fiddle yard to the code 83 flat bottom track I'm using for the main running lines. I try to make sure that every length of rail has a minimum of one dropper. I put the droppers on the bottom of the rail before laying, as this makes them much easier to hide in the ballast later. It doesn't matter so much in the hidden areas, but why not start as I mean to go on? Give the wire a good solid tug to make sure it's firmly attached. There's nothing worse than wiring up a dropper under the baseboard, only to see that it's come away from the rail. Here's the first piece in position, ready to glue down. 
I'm slewing the track out a bit here to give a little bit more clearance around the inside of the curve, but there's still plenty of space for the adjacent curve. I make minor alignment adjustments like this from time to time as I'm building. There's nothing like seeing it in full scale off the plan to suddenly see that the clearance is a little bit too tight here or it would look better if slewed across a bit there. Underneath the board, the droppers appear here. I've planned this out so that the droppers line up with the gap between the lines at this location, giving the most clearance possible. At this point, I put the camera down and cracked on with the construction. Once you've seen one piece of track being glued down, you've seen almost all of them. Four tracks are now laid to the changeover point where the good track will take over. The last of the hidden track is being glued down over here. Time for the bridge to go back in. I'm gluing some PCB sleepers on the edges of the boards. I've got a piece of MDF in place at the edge instead of underlay foam because I want a 100% solid alignment control here and the foam has just enough movement in it to cause potential running problems. Here are the first tracks in position approaching the bridge. The track in use is exacto scale fast track concrete track bases, which you can see a discussion about linked here. On the bridge, I'm using Pico individually pandrel clips laid on longitudinal balks. The join in the middle of the bridge is intentional. If I had run one continuous piece of rail between the two soldered joints, I would have had endless problems with the rail buckling or pulling away from the joints as it expanded and contracted with heat changes. The track has got to the north side of the room at long last. Here is the first piece being glued on the north side. Unfortunately, I did have to realign that first piece of track as a kink had developed into it, enough to cause my two worst case test coaches to rub against each other. The second track has also reached the north side. The bridge is starting to look quite impressive with the tracks on it. Nothing is attached yet though, the rails are just sitting roughly in place. All four of the tracks now cross the bridge and get to the north side of the room. Here is the alignment I've come up with around the bridge pillar. At this point, the track is continuous across the bridge and glued down on both sides, but the rails are still loose on the bridge itself. The next step is to solder the track to the PCB sleepers. This is soldering for a mechanical join rather than an electrical one, but the principles are broadly the same. The only difference is the appearance of the joint is also very important here. I need it to look at least somewhat like a base plate, and not to interfere with the wheel flanges. The cylinders next to the joints are roller gauges. These help keep the rails the correct distance apart as I'm soldering them down. These gauges were made for code 75 rail, but they seem to work fine with the code 83 that I have here. Let's speed this up a bit. If you're enjoying this video or finding it useful, please hit the like button. If you have a question, suggestion, or want to discuss something that I've covered, please leave a comment. And if you want to see more of this layout as I continue to work on it, please do subscribe. You've got to be quite careful soldering sleepers. The inside of the rail has to stay clean so that wheels can run past without hitting the solder. Remember to test whatever it is in your collection that has the biggest flanges. By the way, have you noticed any improvement in the audio in this video? Let me know in the comments if this is better. When people complained about my audio last time, I went searching through the house for spared hardware. Now I've spent some actual money on stuff and I would like to know if it's been worth it.
Fixing the pandrel clips down to the wooden box was... interesting. This is something I've never done before. My first thought was to use cyanoacrylate superglue, but I could also see how difficult that would be when you can't lift one pandrel clip because the previous one is now stuck down. The advice of people who have done this previously was to use methyl ethyl ketone, also known as MEC or butanone. This isn't technically a glue, it's actually a solvent that will melt the plastic a bit. When gluing two plastic parts together, this forms a very strong, permanent bond as the edges of the plastic melt into each other and you end up with what is effectively one piece of plastic afterwards. But between plastic and wood, it's not immediately clear how this would work. Looking into it further, the idea is you press the chair down into the wooden sleeper and it re-solidifies matching the shape of the wood grain. This creates a fairly solid mechanical bond because it is now interlocking with the wood grain. I found this really slow going. The mech soaks into the wood, which means you need to paint it on a lot thicker than you'd imagine. It also flashes off really fast. You need to only do a few chairs at a time and then wait or clamp the rail in place straight away. With well over 600 individual pandrel clips to do here, I found myself getting impatient, doing too big a section and it not sticking properly. I'd have to go back over some spots several times where other parts did stick first time. It's worth noting that mech is not good for you as well. A well ventilated area is really important when working with this stuff. Despite the fact that it's the middle of winter, I've got a side window open in this room, plus another one wide open on the other side of the house. The wind catches them and pulls air through the top floor quite effectively, ensuring continuous air changes in this room. It's better than having a fan on, which just circulates the same air round and round. Again, I'm using the gauges to keep the rails the correct distance apart throughout this process. If I was doing this again, I'd definitely get a few more gauges. Two wasn't really enough. When using a track gauge like this, make sure you're in the right groove. The outer grooves are for the rails and the inner groove is intended for check rails, not running rails. If you get a running rail in the check rail groove by accident, your gauge will be too narrow and your trains will not run on this track. Time for a quick test to see if something runs across the bridge or if there are any major issues I need to sort out. That looks successful. To separate the bridge from the rest of the layout, the rails need to be cut. I'm using a fine razor saw to do this. It cuts through the head and the foot of the rail very easily, but the web of the rail is a little bit more of an issue as it tends to have problems cutting through the thinnest part. When using a razor saw like this, watch out for catching adjacent track with the back or front edges of the saw. This would break the track away from the board and really mess up your plan to keep everything perfectly aligned.
Keep testing things to reveal running issues as you build. Here is the completed bridge with the sides back on temporarily. I have a lot more cosmetic work to do inside the bridge, including adding walkways for track workers and electrification equipment inside the span before the structure is complete enough to permanently fix the sides on. Nevertheless, track is successfully across the bridge and onto the north side of the room. The next task will be to wire this track up to new control points and lay more track up and over the bridge on the south side of the room towards where the entrance to the yard is and soon it will be time to lay the first visible points. But that's a job for a later video. See you next time up here in the study at Dongit's Model Railway.